Welcome to this uh, event or afternoon talking about funding the arts. Um, okay, I guess I should begin with trying to answer one or two questions. First of all, who am I? I'm Richard Rushton and I'm a lecturer in film studies from Lancaster University. Uh, so why am I interested in this project and what is the project? Well, the project is funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council as part of their uh, research networking scheme. Um, and essentially the project is one that's investigating the interrelations between art, film and theatre. The way we're doing that is via this term theatricality, which is a term that's used in criticism and theory in uh, the fields of art, film and theatre. Um, the term theatricality is very much a kind of academic term. Um, so perhaps uh, this is an indicator that certainly half of the project is to do with uh, academic studies and another half of the project is to do with uh, more public facing um, investigations. So much of the theoretical and academic side of the project uh, is coming from the perspective of the work of Michael Fried, uh, who has done a lot of uh, theoretical work on the notion of theatricality, especially in, the relation, in relation to the history of art and especially the history of modern art. We picked up on a statement of his uh, from his famous essay from 1967, Art and Objecthood, where he claims that what lies between the arts is theatre. And we've tried to think through that idea on the basis that perhaps theatricality is a way of describing uh, various conjunctions between the arts. Um, so I don't want to go into too much detail uh, about this sort of academic side of things, uh, but it's probably worth highlighting that we will be holding an academic symposium on this topic uh, in September, and this will be held at Lancaster University. Uh, and coming out of that symposium will most likely be a book of essays uh, on the topic. So. If, if that's okay, so if that's one side of the project, then another question the project poses uh, relates to arts funding. We tried to think, well, there are differences between art, film, and theatre, and there are conjunctions, and we tried to think, well, how are these different kinds of arts funded? And we thought this was a a question worth investigating as the sort of second half uh, of this project. Um, okay, so today's event is essentially part of the project that tries to uh, ask questions relating to this topic. Uh, we did also hold a similar event in Lancaster in April. Uh, and that mainly focused on arts organisations in the north of England, whereas today is trying to look more sort of nationally or more uh, generally at the nature of arts funding in the UK. Um, and really we're trying to get a snapshot of you know, the nature of funding in the UK at the moment in these different uh, artistic fields. Uh, whether that be fine art, theatre or film. Um, okay, so who are we speaking to? Well, we're speaking to a wide variety of people, I think. We're speaking to students and prospective artists or filmmakers or theatre practitioners who are trying to get information about how the various arts are funded. But we're also trying to think uh, in terms of government policy makers and trying to think through the details of government policy, trying to see where that's located now and what kinds of directions it might be going in in the future. So in a sense, we're trying to 
speak to as wide a range as people uh, as is possible. So that's effectively what today is about, trying to think about the various different ways that the different kinds of arts are funded in the UK. Uh, so we have a series of speakers. The way that things are going to be organised, for reasons I won't go into, is that first of all we're going to hear from Richard Russell and then straight after him we'll hear from uh, Professor Sir Christopher Frayling. And then we'll have... a. Uh, open the floor to question and answers after those two speakers. Then, after we finish the question and answer session uh, with those two speakers, we'll then hear from the Desperate Optimists, Rachel Valentine-Smith and Andrew Quick. And then again, after that, there'll be opportunity for more questions. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am actually the Chief Operating Officer rather than the CEO. I've just been elevated very quickly, very happy about that. I'm sure my boss will uh, be happy to hear it. Um, uh, thank you, I can't see anyone, so I can't quite see how many people are out there, but uh, thanks very much, uh, Richard, for inviting me um, here today. So, um, as I say, I'm Chief Operating Officer at the Arts Council England, and uh, my job is to lead on um, all our investment functions, uh, our governance and planning work. I'm also the exec lead on our Goal 5 work, which is all to do with um, ensuring access to uh, children and young people to high-quality arts and cultural experiences. Um, it's great to be here at the ICA, um, one of our uh, national portfolio organisations, and uh, it's quite uh, interesting that uh, the ICA is all about uh, creating great access to uh, high quality uh, arts. Um, it's a shame that the barriers that we experienced today in getting into the building um, were such that they were, but that's not necessarily reflective of the way that the organization normally operates. They're just going through a major uh, capital project uh, at the moment, but it's lovely to be here uh, and to be with you this afternoon. Um, I'm sorry I'm not going to be able to uh, stay for the uh, the wine and the nibbles uh, later on because I have to get back uh, for, for another meeting, but uh, I, I will be with you for the first part of the afternoon. Um, so just to say a little bit about the Arts Council, um, in case uh, people are not aware of who we are. So we are the National Development uh, and Investment Agency for the Arts Museums and Libraries in England. There are sister organisations operating in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. And we have a 10-year strategy, which is all about bringing uh, great art to everyone. And uh, our job is really to uh, pass on money that we get from the government and through the National Lottery to individuals and organizations. We also conduct research. We do uh, offer advice to uh, artists and arts organizations, museums and libraries about the best way to go about uh, what they're trying to do, uh, and we champion the arts to everyone, including to government and to the media. In particular, we're funded by uh, DCMS, uh, and we support activities across the whole of the art form range, from reading to dance, uh, theatre to literature, from visual arts to collections, and we support activities which cut across all of these different art forms. Uh, and I think that's the point that I want to bring out uh, this afternoon in this particular uh, discussion, because we're increasingly, and have been doing for some time, seeing artistic projects which focus on or utilize film uh, or creative and digital media to reach new audiences and explore innovative ways of producing great art. So what I'm going to talk about are some of the different ways in which we support this work um, with a particular focus on our grant giving uh, capacity. Uh, and then I'll go on to reflect in a little bit more detail on what we're currently doing specifically on film. So um, firstly to talk about the national portfolio, I mentioned the ICA is one of our national portfolio organizations. One of the main ways in which we uh, support great art and culture is through the national portfolio, which we see as the bedrock of our funding, supporting cultural organizations across England. Uh, a couple of 
weeks ago, we announced a new portfolio of 831 organizations, which we will fund for four years, from 2018 to 22. And in total, our support for these organizations amounts to 1.6 billion uh, of funding. The portfolio is made up of organizations of all sizes and scales across England. Uh, and this time, we have included 187 organizations uh, which are classified as combined arts, into which a lot of the, uh, the kind of activity that we're talking about this afternoon may fall. Um, and combined arts organizations uh, demonstrate uh, interaction between different art forms, uh, creating something new and exciting. And that can involve outdoor arts, carnival, festivals, spectacle, interdisciplinary work, live art, participatory and social art practice. The activities of these organizations take place in a diverse range of venues, from established theaters and galleries to communal settings, across art form venues and art centers, pop-up spaces and outdoor sites. A couple of examples, we fund the Manchester International Festival, which is currently running uh, in the city. And a quick look through their program for the current festival shows an exciting mix of different art forms bringing together music, theater, dance, poetry, and more. Um, I've been in Manchester earlier this week and certainly experienced mixtures between film and theater and also visual arts and film. And that's just two small examples of the many things that the Manchester International Festival is doing. Manchester International Festival is also uh, going to run a new cross art form production and creation space called Factory, which is a major investment in the cultural infrastructure of the North, which is due to open in 2020. We also are funding a wide range of uh, organizations, including the Future Art Centers Network, which bring in organizations experimenting with new ways of making, viewing, and distributing art. Abandoned Normal Devices, for example, encourages artists to reflect on and play with the impact of new technologies. The organization recently took virtual reality and drone technology to the Lake District and are currently running a residency at Jodrell Bank Center for Astrophysics, enabling artists to collaborate with scientists and researchers and creating a new audiovisual work to be projected onto the iconic Lovell Telescope. We will be encouraging all of our national portfolio organizations to increase the quality and amount of digital content and experiences available to audiences in part because we recognize that this is how audiences are increasingly engaging with culture. David Bowie, as he did in so many artistic and cultural context, commercial contexts, led the way on this. Back in 2003, he launched his album Reality to 50,000 fans in 88 cinemas in 22 European cities via a satellite link to a live performance in London's Riverside Studios. This move inspired the New York's Metropolitan Opera to simulcast live performances into cinemas and outdoor spaces in 2006. And since then, organizations such as the National Theater and Royal Opera House have been at the forefront of developing this new form of engagement and distribution. We want to ensure the opportunities here are seized on by all of our MPOs. So we're asking them to think about captured content where existing works of art and culture, such as performances and museums collections, are captured and distributed digitally to reach wider audiences, about cultural learning content, such as a video of a talk by a curator that is produced and circulated digitally to increase people's knowledge about arts and culture, and also creative content, where digital media and technologies are central to the creation of new artworks and cultural experiences. I'll touch more on the success of NT Live in this area in a few moments. The Arts Council will also continue to develop our work with film, which we support as a standalone art form in its own right and as a medium through which to convey other forms of artistic and cultural expression. On the former, we directly support film and film related organisations through our national portfolio, including three MPOs that are London based but work nationally and internationally. 
The Arts Council supports Film London's Flamin Productions Strand, an open submission development and production scheme for artists moving image work, with awards from 20,000 to 50,000 available for projects that represent a significant leap in artists' careers. The scheme is for single screen work of 20 minutes or more. Lux, which supports and promotes artist moving image practice, and Film and Video Umbrella, which commissions, curates, produces, and presents artist moving image work that are staged in collaboration with galleries and other cultural partners across the UK. In addition to uh, the funding that we do through our national portfolio, we also support film and creative media through our other two main funding programmes. Our responsive open access programme, Grants for the Arts, offers awards from £1,000 to £100,000 to support a wide variety of arts-related activities. In particular, through this programme, we support artists moving image work. For example, we funded the Experimenter Artist Film and Alternative Moving Image Culture Strand hosted at the BFI on the South Bank. Our other main funding stream is called Strategic Funding, which we use to address perceived gaps in existing provision or where we feel there are new opportunities to explore. An example of where we want to address a gap is our Random Acts Network Centres programme in partnership with Channel 4, which is creating pathways into the film and creative industries for young people aged 16 to 24 from diverse backgrounds who might not otherwise who might otherwise struggle to find their first opportunity. Over three years, this programme will train and support 360 young artist filmmakers to make their first three minutes short to be considered for inclusion in Channel 4's Random Act Strand on TV and online. An example where we want to explore an emerging strategic opportunity is our Canvas channel on YouTube through which we want to help arts and culture organisations to make the most of opportunities to reach new and different audiences by using video to showcase the creative work that they do. YouTube video tends to be short form, but the Arts Council is also keen to support longer form work in the medium of film, where it supports and helps to achieve greater circulation and impacts from the creative work of the organisations we fund. The most obvious example is the hugely successful NT Live initiative of the National Theatre, which I mentioned earlier, and which the Arts Council has supported from its inception in 2009. NT Live broadcasts have now been experienced by over 5.5 million people in over 2,000 venues around the world, including over 650 venues in the UK alone. With support from our strategic funds, we are hoping that the NT Live digital distribution model featuring captured work from arts organisations across England of different types and scales, can be made even more widely available in neighbourhood venues, such as village halls, libraries and pubs. This is through the Synergy Arts and Film Project, with funding by the Arts Council in partnership with the BFI, which is currently being piloted, hopefully, at a pop-up cinema venue somewhere near you until March 2018. So, what we fund in the area of film reflects both our own priorities as an organisation and also the funding and policy responsibilities in relation to film set out for the Arts Council and the BFI in a 17-year-old document called Film in England. Film and moving image has moved on hugely as an art form since then, with, for example, the emergence of interactive storytelling and technologies like virtual and augmented reality. So together, the Arts Council and the BFI are currently working on a redefinition of our respective roles and interests in relation to film, which we hope to publish in the near future. Finally, we're currently working on new plans and priorities for our Grants for the Arts programme, which will be relaunched in April 2018. And it's likely that the criteria will be more accommodating of film and creative media based work to reflect the increasing importance of these technologies to how 21st century arts and culture organisations make and showcase their work and how audiences are increasingly consuming and experiencing it. So I hope today I've given you a sense of the different ways in which the Arts Council invests in projects and in particular our support for artistic projects which incorporate a focus on creative media and film. We're really excited about how our new national portfolio will help the sector to improve on these areas of work from 2018 
and we'll be saying more about the future direction of our other funding streams, grants for the arts and strategic funding over the coming year. For now, thank you very much for listening. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to start with a flashback and then bring things up to date. Uh, when first I became chair of Arts Council England in 2003, one of the first things I noticed was that outside the main meeting room where the council took place, council meetings took place, was a series of mainly black and white studio photographs of past chairmen of the council hanging in a neat line, and they were all men in those days. Starting with Maynard Keynes, the original founder of the Arts Council, and including Kenneth Clark, Arnold Goodman, uh, Peter Palumbo, Grey Gowry, and eventually, uh, towards the end, me. Uh, several of us were, were sitting in the same chair, and that's because Lord Snowden took the pictures and they were all in the same studio. And I couldn't help noticing that only one of these chairmen was smiling, and that was Maynard Keynes. The rest all looked rather gloomy. Why was Keynes smiling? Well, first of all, I think he was smiling because he never had to chair a meeting of the council. Um, he drafted the charter, which was granted early in 1946, but he died on Easter Sunday, 1946, as chairman-designate before the first meeting actually took place. It's actually quite tough to chair the Arts Council, steering one's way through the competing interests of art forms, regions, the ministry, accountability regimes from the Treasury, uh, protecting arts organisations from increasing paperwork, balancing the portfolio clients and the one-offs, and how on earth do you turn one into the other, and trying to encourage the national companies to be more national. Um, I was a member of the council in the 1980s and 90s, representing successively visual art, film, video, and broadcasting, as it was then known, combined arts and education, and I chaired the council for five years from 2003 to 2008. And I used to start meetings by asking every person round the table to tell us the most exciting arts event they'd been to since the last meeting. They had two minutes to do so, uh, to remind us of what on earth we were doing there, uh, because it was very easy to forget that the punchline of all this was the arts, and uh, the bureaucracy sometimes became an end in itself. What was extraordinary was that in the five years that I was chairman of the Arts Council, not a single person mentioned a film. In my photo, I wasn't smiling. Secondly, Keynes was smiling, I believe, because he'd recently launched the Arts Council in the wake of the influential beverage report of 1943 and 1944 on slaying the five giants of physical poverty, want, idleness, ignorance, disease, and squalor. And Keynes had been working behind the scenes on ways of slaying a sixth giant, as he put it, in between trying to found the International Monetary Fund in Washington, a sixth giant the poverty of aspiration, he said, which got in the way of most attempts to lift people out of physical poverty and which access to, engagement with, and the practice of the arts could significantly help to alleviate. So making the arts available, he said, could be considered a right on a level with healthcare, education, and public housing. And it was a very radical idea in June 1945. He also talked about how, after the conflict of the Second World War and the bombing of cities, the arts could help to bring people together and remind them of why they were fighting in the first place. Exactly the sort of argument put by the new director of the Tate, I couldn't help noticing, last week. The press launch of the council took place on the 12th of June, 1945, with Keynes sitting next to the Chancellor of the Exchequer, a most unusual seating plan, as uh, the Chief Operating Officer will confirm, I'm sure, and it was adapted into a BBC radio broadcast. His speech began with the story of how, in the Second World War, quote, when our spirits were at a low ebb, music, drama, and pictures were carried to places which otherwise would be cut off from the masterpieces of happier times. Uh, this originated as a protection of the best in our culture against the barbarians, putting a wall around the arts, but soon, as Keynes said, we found to our surprise that we were providing what had never existed, even in peacetime, and that there was a much larger public out there than his Bloomsbury friends, and indeed the whole intellectual elite of the day, had ever anticipated. The British had an innate suspicion of the word culture, but under attack, they decided that after all, a national culture was worth defending. So it wasn't just a question of replacing what had been taken away. 
it would one day become a question of providing what had never existed before. I do not believe it is yet realized what a very important thing has happened, he said. State patronage of the arts, entirely supported by the Treasury, has crept in. It has happened in a very English, informal, unostentatious way, half-baked, if you like. Now, in the war, the Council for the Encouragement of Music and Arts, out of which the Arts Council grew, had been concerned with the professional arts, but it had also been crucially concerned with the amateur arts, community work, and adult education. But Keynes felt that long-term, for financial and artistic reasons, these couldn't or shouldn't be priorities. As he wrote, why are we wasting so much money on amateur effort? It's standards that matter, isn't it? Now, this issue would cause the first of many rows on the Arts Council when it was up and running, with Rafe Vaughan Williams, the composer, walking out and trying to set up a rival organization to give support to amateur work and touring to non-professional venues. Back to that press launch. The main priority, said Keynes, with the little money we have to spill, was to listen to the lessons of wartime and open the doors as widely as convenient to what he called the masterpieces of happier times. Open doors to the best, by which he meant the arts he liked, as chairman of the Royal Opera House Covent Garden, who was married to a ballerina and who'd launched the Cambridge Arts Theatre Trust and was a close friend of the painter Duncan Grant and a member of the Bloomsbury Group. In fact, there's a wonderful portrait of Keynes which hangs in Charleston House, thanks to the Heritage Lottery. In so far as we instruct, he said, it is a new game we are teaching you, you to play and to watch. And he said this to his audience on the BBC, a new game which up to now, quote, only the few used to play. Important opera companies, theatre troops and orchestras were on the brink of bankruptcy and the new council would do what it could about these in partnership with others through a very complicated system to start with of guarantees and loans in the first instance. Not so much grants, but seed corn money and loans and guarantees. Even so, the concept of state patronage of any kind rang alarm bells with some, and there were questions in the House. So um, there was a very particular view of the arts, which was um, uh, embodied in its origins. And that's the first point I really want to make. Keynes was particularly sensitive about any temptation there might be to nationalise culture. And there was much talk in the air of nationalising industry, and that must not, he said, happen to the arts. So you must not have direct government funding of the arts. It must always be filtered through an organisation that involves artists and art specialists. The Nazi regime had shown what happens when government directly runs the arts on the one hand and tries to aestheticise politics as a kind of performance art on the other. And the same with the Italian fascists who'd harnessed avant-garde art, such as futurism, as well as neoclassicism. So instead, in Keynes's inimitable language, the task of an official body is not to censor, but to give courage, confidence, and opportunity. And this was to become known in the trade as the arm's length principle. A third reason Keynes was smiling, I think, is that he had very strong convictions about what the arts were and what they could achieve the view from Bloomsbury. His punchline, it's a wonderful punchline, at the launch of the Arts Council was, let every part of merry England be merry in its own way, death to Hollywood. All of which was soon to be carefully drafted into the Arts Council's charter of early 1946. To increase the availability of art to the public, to improve standards, to encourage people to participate in art, up to a point anyway, and to advise and cooperate with government departments and local authorities on matters relating to these purposes. But Keynes's speech, and indeed the Charter, as they always do, contained all sorts of ambiguities, which basically have been argued about and discussed and become the spectrum of opportunity within the Arts Council ever since. How would cooperation with government departments and local authorities actually work? Access? Improved standards, or both? The best, or the most, or both? Professionals and or amateurs? Housing the arts, and or running the arts? Encouraging art, or encouraging audiences? London and the regions, 
And actually, you know, last week a very successful launch happened of uh, some a wonderful development in the Arts Council of pushing quite a lot of money out into the regions. This was an issue already in 1946, a big issue. The arts and inner city regeneration after the war. What would be the relative roles of councils, philanthropists, and other institutions? Would it be a grant-giving body, or a guarantee-distributing body, or an operating body, what today we'd call a development agency? Would it be a letterbox, or would it actually develop the arts? Relationships with local authorities. Where did the arts end and entertainment begin, and what's the connection between them? Would taxpayers, as we now call them, since the 1980s, Keynes called them citizens, would taxpayers uh, take to heart the idea of the arts as the sixth giant up there with the other five? So in short, the Charter offered a spectrum of possibilities and, uh, as I say, arts funding has been positioning itself on different points in that spectrum ever since. The annual grant to the Arts Council in 1946 was £235,000 and its second chairman, Kenneth Clark went on record as saying immediately, I am not in favour of giving the Arts Council a much larger grant because it will simply get itself into trouble. The Council in 1946 supported 22 theatres and eight orchestras and all seemed well with the world. It was a performing Arts Council. Most of the money went to London on Covent Garden, Sadler's Wells, Sadler's Wells Opera, the Old Vic and the orchestras. And over the next few years, the best for the most, which was Keynes's dream, soon turned into the best for the educated few, a mission to civilise. In the late 1960s, with the arrival of the first ever arts minister, Jenny Lee, and with a step change in the relationship with, between government and the arts, the mission to civilise became much more a mission to socialise. But the basic definition of the arts and of the distinctions between them remained relatively constant as they had in 1946. In 1946, the council supported 22 theatres and eight orchestras. By 1955, this number had doubled. Between 1965 and 1975, the number of organisations rose to 270. And as we've heard today, 815 national portfolio, or what we used to call revenue clients. So the council began with the performing arts, with lyric theatre and music. Visual arts were added in the late 1940s, and there were questions in the House about that as well, about the dangers of investing in contemporary art and supposing it didn't last. Uh, what about the certainty of history? Surely the government should put money into museums, not contemporary art. And literature was added in the mid-1950s. These would have to have much smaller budgets, it was argued, because where the visual arts were concerned, the museums were there to look after the heritage, and where literature was concerned, there were the public libraries and the publishing business. Whereas the orchestras spent most of their time playing the heritage, as did the opera house and theatres. So the relationship of the performing and the visual arts to their respective arts forms was fundamentally different. And one of the themes of today is uh, different ways in which the art forms are funded, and I think that's quite an important consideration. The council would remain a performing arts council for many years with a couple of add-ons, three if you count the arrival of film and video in the 1970s. So finally to today, 70 years later, when we've moved on from a mission to civilise to a mission to socialise to a mission to democratise. Well, this afternoon's conference is centred on the relationship between the different art forms, notably visual art, theatre and film, and in particular on the crossovers between them. When I was chairman, I tried hard to do something about the traditional arts categories which had been inherited from 1946 and, in the case of literature, from the mid-1950s. Much of the most interesting work seemed, and still seems to me, to be coming from crossovers and in the fuzzy edges between categories, the edge of the pond as a site of contestation rather than its centre, and from art forms pushing outwards towards their neighbours, theatre and video, sculpture and interior design, performance art and performing arts, analogue and digital, and so on. And there was a big debate in my time as chairman about what was called writer's theatre and uh, a, a theatre as visual experience. Uh, there were great divisions in the theatre world about that. So the old categories, even as administrative categories, seemed to me to be rather out of date and out of time. 
And the council had in the past responded to this in one of two ways. Either by inventing a special department, uh, a department of combined arts, where mixed media or transdisciplinary events could be evaluated and supported, or by responding to and encouraging dynamism within the traditional art forms. With the increasing visibility of the creative industries in the 1990s, there was also the question of what Will Hutton, in a study of the creative industries, called spillover from publicly funded arts into their industrial counterparts, and what should the council do about that? Um, uh, Cameron McIntosh, the great theatrical impresario, once said in a, in a very important speech that uh, public money paid for students in those days to go through drama school, paid for their first job in a regional rep, and then they were ready to be cast in his productions. He, his, his empire could never afford those development thoughts, and he required the entire edifice of this commercial empire rested, therefore, on the public sector. And that was an important thought, and what, how could we react to that? The extrinsic arguments about the arts uh, were moving on when I was chairman. Originally, it was they're good for tourism. Then it was uh, they were um, good for inner city regeneration, now called a sense of place. Uh, and then it was they're good for creativity. And then it moved into they're good for soft power, diplomacy. Uh, these were the extrinsic arguments, but uh, we can talk about perhaps those later. Um, then there was the separate department of film, video, and broadcasting which from the 70s to the 90s had dealt with artists' film and video and its distribution on 16mm film. And the BFI was thought to be responsible for commercial film, the Arts Council for Artists' Film, or Artists' Moving Image. Um, and also, the committee dealt with the relationship between the council's work and broadcasters. And it was decided before my time as chairman that the department as a separate entity, should be disbanded, with the archive going to Central St. Martins, and with it, Dave Curtis, and the responsibility for the practice going mainly to the BFI, mainly, which seemed odd since so many visual artists were using film and video at precisely the same time, and the technology was helping them to do so. So on my watch, we saw film and digital media beginning to, and a lot's happened since, to re-emerge within the visual arts department and the increasing use of film by other departments. It was kind of sewn into the heartland. I also remember discussions about exhibiting films in the major art galleries, some of which were very resistant to this. After the demise of the Mu Museum of the Moving Image, London was the only capital city in Europe, and it still is, not to have a serious film museum or gallery. There was much rejoicing when Tate announced that it would at last be taking photography seriously, but in a funny way, that showed just how far they had to go to get to film, and they still have. Uh, there was a, a rather wonderful moment in the early lottery where the council wanted to make it a condition of lottery grants that, uh, uh, following the sort of uh, Bowie precedent, that the, um, uh, the organisation should be encouraged to simulcast and broadcast what they were doing. And in the case of one major arts organization, that the building should have wired into it the possibility of broadcasting. They fought like dogs not to do this. It would be debasing the coinage. Now, of course, it's a major income stream. But it wouldn't have happened, actually, if the Arts Council hadn't pushed. For a time, also in the 1990s and 2000s, the Council, as the distributing body for the arts lottery, specified in the Act of Parliament, was charged with looking after feature films. It was an extraordinary moment for about two years, which was at times a very uncomfortable fit. And I have a very clear memory of a heated council discussion about John Maybury's film, Love is the Devil, then presented in script form about Francis Bacon, played by Derek Jacobi, and George Dyer, played by pre-bond Daniel Craig. A senior art critic and curator had lobbied the council hard to try and stop the film from being supported. We were told it was likely to turn out as Carry On Francis and was bound to diminish a great artist in the eyes of the public. And the council was sharply divided on the issue. And in the end, it got through on a show of hands, which is very rare, by one vote. And the vote was mine, and the critic David Sylvester, up to then a friend, never spoke to me again. Eventually, the film element of the lottery, quite rightly, went to the film council and thence to the BFI, with artists' film in a kind of limbo, uh, which perhaps we can talk about as well. My conclusion where this area is concerned was, and to some extent still is, that the language in which such issues are described 
has certainly proved to be responsive and sensitive to change, but that the core values of many arts institutions and of the political elite have not evolved nearly as much. This is the week in which the DCMS became the digital media, culture and sport, rather than the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, uh, used to be the Department of National Heritage, so language actually does matter, but it is extraordinary. It took till 2017 for the word digital to get into the title. From art to arts in the plural. It's very strange. I don't know if you've noticed, but in the real world, people talk about the individual experience of art. They never talk about the arts. That's a word that uh, us administrators use. Uh, then from the arts to culture, and from culture to cultures. From taste to excellence from revenue clients to national portfolio organizations, from sustainability to stabilization to resilience, from regeneration to a sense of place, from art lovers to audiences to access, from aesthetics to creativity, all of which sound much more democratic and inclusive, less to do with elites and less liable to be mocked in the tabloids. But, um, uh, the question is how much out there the substance of people's reflexes about the arts have changed in tandem. Postscript, very brief. When I became chairman of the council in 2003, I was asked by a journalist, how much money do the arts need? And I replied, there's never enough money when you can say we've done it because the arts are an ever-changing and ever-evolving sector and because demand goes up when opportunities go up and as concepts within the arts change. Besides, I added, the return on public investment was huge, unlike most other government spending. Uh, the budget was much smaller than people realised. In those days, 17p a week per person, less than half the price of a pint of milk. And the more sustained investment there was, the more healthy and varied the sector, and the more it stimulated the surrounding economy. Uh, given the sheer amount of culture there was to appreciate, I said, it cost peanuts. The following morning, I opened the newspaper, which was a tabloid, and the headline said, Art Supremo doesn't know how much money is needed for the arts. <laughs> you can't win them all, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Has anybody got an immediate question for either Richard or Christopher? Because uh, I have, actually, if I can just therefore take advantage um, and ask really about the question of how much the digital has actually transformed the landscape of the arts, and to what extent might the digital be um, what gets left behind when there's such a focus on the digital, um, in a sense? What might we be leaving out? That's a big one. That's a big one. Well, I, I will, I, like everybody, I think when I mean when I was deeply involved in the council, because some of the things I'm saying are no doubt a bit out of date. The um, uh, there was a lot of science fiction about what would happen with the digital revolution of the arts, and everyone sort of over-claimed what would happen. You know, it would transform the entire universe, and there'd be instant access, and uh, we could control all sorts of channels of communication, uh, sorry, the Arts Council could control all sorts of channels of communication. And then it sort of settled down, and, 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 and people realized this was a tool for, for doing things that the Arts Council wanted to do anyway, only it could do them perhaps on a broader base and uh, 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 on a wider scale. So that was, that was the state uh, we were in w when I left. But there was there was lots of overexcitement, I think, about digital to start with, and one or two blind alleys, I think, that we went down. Um, one thing, I mean, I don't know if this actually happened, but we talked about bookings, you know, the way in which you could uh, digitize, have clusters of organizations uh, with booking systems, you know, which would actually save on the dreaded front office, which was the great phrase, you know, how do, I, don't know if, I don't know if that happened, but... It's happening all over the place, and, and in a way, I suppose, the issue here is that Digital is just what we are and what we do and how we do it. And um, it's, I, th I think it is slightly um, surprising that uh, at this time in 2017, the, the department changes its name to include digital, when digital is, is kind of what we do. It's everything. It's everything. It's everywhere. Um, and I don't think it's replacing anything. I think it's enhancing and extending. Um, I think also, depending on which generation you're talking about, actually younger people, that's all they've known. And that's, what, that's how they consume a lot of their cultural and entertainment activity, th 
through through digital means. So I think our ability to uh, to to kind of get to grips with it is really really important. One of the one of the things that we found uh, early on in the in the work that we were doing uh, around creative media over the last five years, I would say, is that the arts and cultural organisations behind other sectors and particularly commercial organizations in their use of digital technology in order to help them do what they need to do better. So one of the jobs that we've um, taken on is is uh, to support them in helping them to do that because we think it can extend yes. what they do. I think that's very interesting because uh, perhaps I can say this and you can't because I'm, I'm out of it, but I was always surprised how conservative with a small c some large organizations were and how difficult it was to get them to change. I mean, the example I've quoted, which was, uh, you know, a lot of the big organizations at the time of the lottery and trying to encourage them to broadcast, they hated the idea. They thought it would debase the coinage. You know, we can't, uh, we can't have that. It, 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 we won't be so special if, uh, if it goes into... And, you know, and it took a long time for the penny to drop. And then when the penny dropped, largely as a result of the Arts Council pushing... Uh, suddenly they realised this is a major income, I mean, whether it's DVDs or whether it's uh, broadcast, a major income stream for these organs, and they've got the message. And there's this curious sort of, you know, everyone thinks arts organisations are really radical, and because you think in an arty way, you're, it's not true, actually, is it? I mean, quite a lot of important things, and this hasn't been trumpeted enough in the press, happened because the council lent on organisations, which to start with were feeling quite resistant to it. And I think the digital is a good example. You, you'd think they'd swallow th that hook, line and sinker and immediately see the possibilities. But we had to sort of create special awards for digitization and all this sort of thing to make it attractive, a bit of carrot. It's true though, isn't yeah. it? It's a, yeah. um, I mean, there is, just a follow on, there is a slight issue difference between the digital as a tool and actually the digital as a medium, which I think oh, yeah, has yeah. got lost a very great deal in this conversation. Yeah. A lot of the artists I know who worked in new media back in the day felt, you know, un unloved by arts organisations. Yes. Well, that was in the combined arts to start with. What happens now? Because that department went. It's now sewn into the heartland, is it? Well, we, as, I, as I said earlier, we, we still see combined arts as a category, although I, I agree with you in a way. Categorisation is, is a very unhelpful thing because most activity blurs everything. I mean, we, we do have a, a, a director of combined arts. Her... her her line is that ultimately everything will be combined art. So, you know, her portfolio will be everything. Um, so I think uh, the reality is that the practice that we uh, see in terms of digital media or creative media happens in every art form across the piece. And so it, it categorization is not necessarily appropriate. I mean, I, I, I think that uh, the Arts Council has increasingly understood that uh, investing in this activity is important and doing so through our national portfolio and through project funding is something that we do. Although, as I explained uh, earlier, our Grants for the Arts programme has sometimes felt a little inhospitable to artists who are working in this kind of medium, which is why I explained that we are reviewing that programme with a view to making it more hospitable next year. Now, that's what I was trying to say in my talk, really, that... Um not being too critical, I'm trying to be sort of constructive about this, but there is this time lag, you know, and the language moves on, and it looks as though all the right buttons are being pressed, but actually, in the heartland, it takes a lot longer for the penny to drop, and uh, um, which is frustrating in a way, particularly, I mean, I found it a bit frustrating because I was simultaneously running an art school when chairing the art, and I could see all these, for whom this was a cliché. I mean, they just grew up with this stuff, and that's what they wanted to do, and yet you had to really persuade and fight um, largely middle-aged arts administrators, that this was the coming thing. That, I suppose, is inevitable in any arts or in any major arts funding body, but there's a slight time lag, I think. I don't know if you agree to that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, a question that just back there, Richard, just on the um, side. You should wait for the mic. Thank you. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, it's quite hard to remember everything that was said in the discussion just now. Um, you talk about the governmental funding towards the arts. Um, with the whole government at the moment, and what it's ever-changing at the moment, <laughs> what happens if such, has there been necessary talks or precautions taking place in case such cuts may take place to the arts? Brexit and the arts. Uh, every day. Um, <laughs> so so has any necessary precautions been talked about, maybe? Well, the, the, the situation that we're in is that we have a, a budget confirmed until 2020. 
uh, which means that the, the funding that we announced uh, a couple of weeks ago um, will definitely be able to, to proceed until, until then. Um, the nature of politics being the way that it is, uh, it, it, the government will not commit beyond that at the moment, although what we're doing is we're working on how we can most effectively make the case for uh, continued funding from 2020 onwards, because inevitably there will have to be some kind of spending review or new budget that, that agrees programmes and investment beyond that period of time. So we talk to the government every day. I actually was at a meeting at the Treasury yesterday talking to them about what the best way that we can construct the case is and what kind of evidence the government will need in order to be able to support our ongoing claim for further funding. I think what government has been keen to see us do is to move more money outside of London, which we've done, to see us invest in a wider range of uh, organisations and particularly diverse led organisations, which we are doing, and also to ramp up, which is very pertinent to this conversation this afternoon, uh, the way in which we're encouraging and supporting organisations to use digital technology in what they do. So I think we're doing all the right things. It's just how that then converts into uh, a compelling case that government will, uh, will honour. And of course, it will depend on how much money's in the kitty after Brexit, which your guess is as good as mine. But it's interesting, you know, I was saying about how one has to refresh the argument. There's fashionable arguments about the arts, the extrinsic arguments, aren't there? That, that in the 70s it was tourism, and then it, in the 90s it was the creative industry. Soft power seems to be the thing now, that the pennies dropped, certainly with the Foreign Office that actually uh, the arts are rather useful in, well, A, giving people respect for what the UK does, but B, in pushing out the story uh, as, uh, you know, uh, the arts as diplomacy. Now, I, I'm not an awful fan of these extrinsic arguments, but that's a really useful one in, at the time of Brexit. I mean, so, soft power is, is definitely one of them, but, but uh, inevitably uh, with this government, there will be an emphasis on uh, economic growth domestically, uh, and also on placemaking. You referred to that in yeah. your speech. Uh, these are two critical areas of investment. Uh, there's somewhat of a contradiction between the concept of placemaking and the concept of uh, digital distribution, because digital distribution is by its very nature not place-based. Um, but clearly uh, what they want to see us do is to support activity which helps places across the country to be able to be more sustainable economically and to see culture as part of their success. But a three-year deal at the moment is quite a remarkable thing to have achieved, actually. <laughs> you know, m most people are wondering what's going to happen yes. tomorrow. Yeah. I think we may one, one more question. Yes, just uh, Richard, just there. Uh, this might be a slightly naive question, but um, apart from, you've talked a lot about the MPOs and um, also the grants for the arts, but apart from is the main way that you kind of support um, kind of early career to mid career and emerging creatives, creative companies um, through them applying to your grants? Or is there any way that you kind of actively seek them to support? Or is it only through the grants program? So uh, Grants for the Arts is our main project funding uh, route, which uh, is available to individuals and organizations. So in terms of uh, artists, there is an opportunity to apply through that route. Uh, one thing that we are uh, introducing, and in fact um, our chairman Nick Sorota announced this in a speech last night, is that we will be uh, introducing a new fund for creative practitioners that will be about giving them time for research and development that's not necessarily linked to an artistic or cultural output, which is effectively what Grants for the Arts does. In order to apply for Grants for the Arts, you have to have a project, you have to do something, you have to produce something. And actually a lot of what we want to support artists to do is to have time to think, to reflect, to build their practice. Uh, and actually that's what this Creative Practitioners Fund will do. I think further to that, we do have a, a development role which is about identifying and supporting individuals to, uh, to, to develop what they, what they do. Clearly we link that to their ability to uh, access funding from us to help them to develop that. But we do uh, support people, we talk to people, we give them advice, uh, and that's part of uh, what we are here to do. It's interesting because um because I was partly wearing a university hat and partly 
uh, chair of the Arts Council, we did a working party uh, um, on the relationship between what the council did and research slash advanced practice uh, within practitioner environments, you know, practice so-called practice-based research and so on, because there seemed to be a, a, a really interesting meeting point. And I don't know, I think that, that's still under discussion, isn't it, in the Arts Council, they're talking about that, but, you know, uh, arts as research. Well, as, I, as I've just said, I think the, this Creative Practitioners yeah, exactly. Fund will, right. will be a place where it's more yeah. possible to do that rather than the sort of project funding yeah. that we do through, through grants for the arts. So uh, I, I think these, these things take time to gestate, they don't do. they? They do. <laughs> That's true. That's 10 years, that one. Anyway, never mind. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was um, excellent and a really, really interesting uh, start to this day. And so to thank Richard and Christopher very much for their... Thank you very much. Yeah, the, the, the video was really more of a timing thing, um, so we didn't kind of talk too much um, and see how it goes. I'll, I'll do the first half, Chris will do the second half, <clears throat> because it'll narrate a certain creative journey um, back in Ireland in the mid-80s, when we were both involved in community arts work. Uh, which was our first introduction to the relationship uh, of arts and culture to politics. Um, it's on our it's on our laptop, but it's not on the screen, which is good for us, but maybe not, maybe not so good for you. Um, and so we've never, in a sense, the shift from us as uh, it's sort of like our pre-enlightenment days. Um, were very much when we began to work with this organization called the CAFE, which is the Creative uh, Activity for Everyone, which is run by a, a, an Irish playwright called Peter Sheridan, who, um, who's the brother of Jim Sheridan. Uh, and they'd set up this arts, uh, the Project Arts Centre in Dublin. Um, that our understanding of art was always in relationship, or art and culture was always in relationship to politics, hence our for initial involvement in community arts and it was from then we got to a certain point where they encouraged us to go over to the UK to a, a rather interesting context called Dartington College of Arts who I don't know if, if uh, I know Christopher does know this because that's when we first uh, met Christopher he gave us uh, he handed out an award to a whole load of students that year including ourselves uh, but he did make this comment about which we were reminding him earlier on about as an artist, you don't know what you've done un until you've, or you don't know what you're doing until you've done it. So in, in a sense, the idea that you launch into an arts event or a project knowing exactly what you want to do uh, is, is a very strange thing, whereas you're in a much better position to know what it is, what you've done after you've done it, sometimes years after you've done it, in, in a way. People have been talking about David Bowie. As I've been listening to this, it did remind me of a comment that Bowie made that the desire to be an artist is actually akin to having a mental health problem. So in a sense, whenever I see a room of artists, I really see a, a lot of inpatients um, that need a lot of um, therapy. Why people want to make art, I have no idea. Um, it's not really helpful to them in the long run. I think a, a great funder of the arts also are artists. They take a hit every time they work in the arts. I know people, even when they're national portfolio organizations, actually subsidize those projects themselves. Um, hence their, I don't know whether the, I remember hearing a story once that the average artist learn, earns less than, you know, 8,000 pounds. So I think that's a reality check. Um, for us, when we, when we went through and did this four year degree at Dartington, it was really about process, was, was a key thing, and form. Uh, which was very different in Ireland because it was just a given. This is writing, this is theatre, this is music. And to, to, be, to have access to artists who were trying to explore the form of these things um, was very, very difficult. Obviously, somebody like Beckett and Joyce uh, were exploring the form of literature uh, and drama, but they weren't in Ireland uh, and they had, they had left. And it was often very um, people who were exploring form were part of that experimental arts, and were that was 
uh, revered, but mostly um, not revered, whatever the opposite revered. Of, <laughs> dis there was a lot of disdain uh, that it was seen as elitist or very pretentious, and I think it's taken a long time for artists working in the area of the edges that uh, Christopher talked about to be fully appreciated for their contribution. The, the avant-garde, uh, if you will, are often exploring some very valuable uh, things that eventually get under, understood. So I think for us, the access that we had to various visitors in Dartington was uh, critical uh, to our development and sort of blew our minds in many respects. And so this interstices between community arts, which Dartington did a lot, and also arts that are in culture that could be quite experimental, then suddenly we're not, uh, not enemies at all. That people who are working in communities and being experimental were now being seen as uh, these were not mutually exclusive. And this was very uh, important to us. And we tried to take that into our theatre work for the first six, seven years uh, when we graduated from Dartington. We had organized a platform down in Dartington, which uh, Lois Keaton, who was then, who had just become the new director of uh, performance here at the ICA, saw. Luckily, she liked and invited us to come up here and perform in 1992. Um, and and they, the ICA gave us our first commission as well. So it was a, it was a very useful and important uh, way of graduating out of a university into the big bad world. T together. Um, and after a while, I remember we were trying to chase down revenue funding, as it was called. But we, at that point, because we were using quite a lot of film and video in our live theater work, and we did used to call it theater, by the way, we didn't call it live art. It was sort of, we, we, there was, Lois had brought down this idea that there was the live arts and then there was theater. And what we really wanted to do was to not let theater off the hook and keep calling what we were doing theater, therefore the boundaries or the edges of theater would keep widening, as opposed to if you call it live art, the language would reinforce the narrowness of what theater might be. And I think that was, a, in a way, I think Lois is probably right, but I think there's also kind of a moment lost there that people say that, okay, well, that's not theater, thank God, at least this is theater. So somehow we feel safe in that. And we kind of were very keen that that kept progressing and widening. Um, but just as we were gaining quite a, a reputation, so we were touring a, a lot around the country and getting Arts Council support and venue support, so venues would put in a certain amount of money and the Arts Council would put in a certain amount of money, we were in a very strong position to become a, a revenue-funded uh, organisation, but we decided actually we don't want to... Uh, spend the next four years making any theatre work. Um, we want to actually move and become filmmakers or moving image makers or moving between uh, the relationship between film uh, as, as you would see in a cinema. So we have screened here on a number of occasions, but also work that may be seen in, in galleries. So we had begun this series of works of working going back in a way to the 80s in our community arts work, but now using the camera. And we made a piece of work in 2003 that was very successful, that toured a lot around the world, um, which was using a local community up in Enfield, several hundred people there, using a, a 35 millimeter film. It was still the time when just film, not, not no DCPs, which you, they, the ICA would have. Actually, they may well have a 35 millimeter projector as well. But it was enough money to shoot on 35 millimeter. The idea being that that local community could see themselves and their area, their place in their local multiplex. So the desire was to do a rather extravagant, ambitious community arts project, but that would happen in a, in a multiplex. And it was the, the cinema, our, a, a space that we love, is an incredibly undemocratic, undemocratic, difficult place, still and increasingly becoming a more difficult place to have work uh, presented in. Theatres are much more open, visual art, music, but cinema proper, in that narrow sense of the word, is becoming an incrementally, and I'm, this is going back to 2008, palpably a more difficult place for um, political, commercial, aesthetic reasons. 
we made about 10 of these civic life films, which were basically us working with a local community and doing a model where we would look and investigate that space and present that in a local multiplex. Some of these were represented Ireland in the, South, in the Biennale, for example, and many were shown in cinemas and gallery contexts. But we had sensed a, a funding opportunity in 2006, 2007, when we made quite a number of them, that if we could combine a lot of commissions and get match funding from the Arts Council, we couldn't, we could make our first feature film, uh, which we did do, and it was called Helen, and it was very, again, quite successful film that got picked up, released extensively around uh, the country and in several other countries. And this was a highly experimental film, for want of a better term. It was comprised of about 40 in single long take shots. It, uh, it was commissioned by Dublin Docklands Development Authority, uh, Liverpool Cultural Capital at the time, um, Birmingham City Council and um, Tyneside Cinema with uh, Newcastle and Gateshead. Uh, their fa excess money from their failed bid to be a cultural capital that Stella Hall had kept on the table that they could invest in in projects. And that film um, happened just before the global financial crisis. And it was the years after that that we realized that you couldn't put a package like that together. Councils had cut back. The Dublin Docklands Development Authority had more or less collapsed. And we had sort of gotten in financially uh, in, in, into that world that we wanted to uh, see and test out and see what artistically you could do with it and that the funding was just about available and we understood enough about the British-Irish uh, funding map that we could have those meetings and secure that, those uh, small amounts of money to put together. I think the eventual budget was about £280,000, which in, to make a feature film shot on 35mm and everybody getting paid, which is important to us, w was quite a, a feat. But to, it would be A, financially impossible to do today, we suspect, and B, artistically, that film would not be touched with a barge pole now because things have become incredibly conservative. Now, that's a world that we're still very much in. It was because of Helen that the BFI then approached us, who were the UK Film Council, to talk about developing a proper feature film. And now I'm going to hand you over to Christine to complete that story. Um, Good luck. Yeah, so, yeah, we, um, I'm being totally abandoned, left on my own on the stage. Um, we, yes, we made this feature film called Helen, and there's clips of it that we're looking at at the moment. And it did bring us into another world, the world of film funding. It's interesting to hear um, our, the two speakers from earlier because um, our desire was somewhere along the line to make a feature film, whatever that meant. And I think maybe it um, related to some romantic notion about the space of cinema and came out of our own love of cinema that was there right from the, the beginning, even through the years when we made theatre. So um, to find ourselves in the world of film financing, which is very different to the way we made Helen, because Helen was made as a community arts project where the end product happened to be a feature film. But actually, along the way, it was lots of other things as well, because it was all about um, community engagement and events that we did along the way and different types of engagement along the way. But we ended up with a film to be shown in a cinema space. And for us, that was very much a part of the, the argument about the democratization of the space, the space of cinema, because it's a very undemocratic space. It's one of the most popular art forms, you could argue, and yet it's one of the most difficult spaces to get into. And we have also discovered a number of years down the line that even having made a proper grown-up feature film or two, it's still a really difficult space to get into um, because you get into the really murky world of distribution. And also how everything has changed so quickly. So as Joe said, with Helen and with our short films, the Civic Life films, you sent film reels to a festival. You had your film processed onto print. There were no digital projectors. Now that was just back in 2006. 
2008 when we first screened Helen, most cinemas didn't have digital projectors. It was still about the world of print. But at the very same time, that world was falling apart. So all the expertise, all the, the machinery around film production was disappearing. Um, because, you know, um, facilities houses were closing down all over the place. We in, um, was it Helen or was it Chong Baru? One of the films that we did on print was the very last film that a uh, you know, really well-known, highly respected editor in the UK um, did on print, on print stock. And he had sold all his equipment to um, facilities houses in Turkey. And he went from working in a big facilities house in Soho to working in a, his garage at home in wherever he lived. I can't remember now. But you know, so the, the industry was changing. And yes, we were still trying to make this transition at the same time. Um, so I'm trying to reel myself back in again. The thing about migrating over into the proper world of film in terms of funding is that literally everything changes. So I felt it was like migrating into another country. Um, the language of it, the way the money works, the way things are funded, everything changes. Because in a way, we had become used to, number one, producing our own work, work that we made that was ours and um, having real control over that, um, and being funded as artists. So people were interested in us, who we were, and what we were bringing to the table. And so the project is obviously important, but really, we were important. And I would say that that's probably still very much the case in terms of arts funding in the UK today. Um, but at the time when we were dealing with the Arts Council, you had relationships with the heads of the various departments, like the head of combined arts or the head of theatre. People, you could access people, you could ask them to come and see your show. And we know that people used to meet around tables and, you know, um, you know there used to be bun fights around funding decisions, but it was all about people talking and discussing and responding and reacting. Now I don't know actually what goes on. It's interesting because we still do apply to Grants for Arts every so often to support other kind of projects that we're doing. But it feels, feels very um, unpersonal. You just send in your application form, you get something back, you don't know who read it, who didn't. You don't know who to invite to see the work and nobody even asks. Um, but anyway, so I think it is a very different world. But the world of fil film financing is very, very difficult. Number one, it's completely glacial. And, um, you know, as Christopher said, it's a, it's a commercial world. The BFI exists in a commercial world. And yet it isn't commercial because there's an industry that's really commercial. And this is public funding. It's, it's about um, supporting filmmakers outside of the real hardcore commercial end of the industry. And yet it's commercial. It's like this terrible kind of... Um, predicament I think that ultimately the filmmakers find themselves in and I would say um, although we have made films and the films have been very well received and they've gotten out there people aren't necessarily completely interested in us as filmmakers at least not at the initial stages it's all about the script and to be in that kind of scriptural economy was also very very different for us for us because uh, all the work we made up until then didn't exist in that scriptural economy but this is all about at least initially, about the script. And the slowest part of the process, and believe me, can take absolutely years, is the developmental phase. And yet the developmental phase is the, the most badly supported financially. So, you know, it could take four years to develop a script, realistically speaking. But along the way, you'd be lucky if you're able to access, you know, £50,000 worth of funding to support that. So how do you rationalise that as you try to survive, pay bills, got a mortgage, got a child, et cetera, et cetera? So the whole thing is glacial. It's difficult. It's incredibly, incredibly competitive because, you know, if the development end of it is out here, by the time you come to films that are actually financed, it's, you know, it's a tiny, tiny amount. There's a tiny amount of the films that are developed that actually end up with a piece of the production pie, if that's the route you're, that you're choosing to take, which is certainly the route that we've taken. Um, so having made, you know, between 2003 and 2007 off our own bass producing everything that we did and involving lots of other creative and funding organizations, we made 10 short films and a feature length film. And then between 2008 and 2013, we made one feature film. And then we're now in the next stage where we're trying to make another feature film, although we don't know why. I think we, the thing, maybe we're doing it because 
you learn so much as you do it. And although it's an incredibly wounding experience along the way, or it can be, um, you don't want to step away from us and just turn your back on everything that you've learned and you want another go. Well, we certainly do. We don't feel that we've, <laughs> we've quite gotten it out of our system yet. But we've been working on a new feature film. And, you know, along the way again, the development is very slow. It's very badly paid. So we came out of us to make this um, a documentary feature film called um, Further Beyond, which brought us back into, uh, you know, Arts Council funding, but this is Irish Arts Council funding. Um, and Ireland is it's a, obviously a smaller country, um, therefore, uh, you know, the money works differently, but they, they have always thought about film in relationship to arts funding in a different way, and they've had really interesting schemes that have been up and, run, up and running for a long time. For example, they do have the Artist Development Award, and they've had it for years. So they say, here's 15,000 euro or 20,000, or whatever it is that you need within a kind of a sliding scale, and spend a year thinking or whatever, whatever it is that you need to do, argue your case, and um, there's awards that are available. They've also always had a film award for single screen, not gallery based. And anyway, we made this documentary feature film um, further beyond through their scheme called Real Art, which has kind of taken us out of this glacial world and back into a world where things are quick and you are funded because of who you are. Um, we went in with, you know, a, a treatment, but that's about all that we put on the table. Really, they were looking at us and they wanted us to make something. Of course, we had to do the treatment to go through the process of applying. But, um, you know, the feature film that we made, uh, the whole thing happened in less than 11 months and for 80,000 euro. And we've ended up with a feature film that, again, has been in festivals. It had a release in the UK. It's been on Mubi. It's going to be on the BFI player platform. And it kind of reconnected us to a way of working and how funding can work if if you um, trust the, the makers. So one of the points I um, want to make from earlier, that if the Arts Council are leaning on the arts organisations, where are they getting the urge to lean from? And I would say it always comes from the artists. It goes back to the artists, because the artists are always ahead, miles ahead, and also being incredibly nimble and strategic, because for a long time, when we were trying to get money for film work in the UK and um, through the Arts Council, you could never mention the word film. So I am really impressed today, it's taken them a long time to catch up, that the word film is being used because it was like the devil's language. It was, do not say the word film because you're in the wrong place and go look elsewhere. And we had to always call what we were doing moving image or find interesting ways of um, describing what we're doing so that we didn't get get lost in the, the cracks where the work doesn't get funded. And there's lots of those cracks. Um, and so maybe they're being addressed slowly, but of course the artists are always ahead. They're always ahead of the funders and then the, the big institutions. Um, I don't know what else to add to that. I think we've probably, we're ahead of ourselves. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think we've maybe probably said what we want to say, yeah. Um, hi everyone, I can't see anybody, but hi. Um, uh, the film, which was beautiful, um, puts my PowerPoint presentation to shame, so I'm sorry it's not nearly as glamorous. Um, so yeah, I'm Rachel and I am one of the joint artistic directors of The Faction. Um, the other artistic director is currently in Romania with some RADA students, so I'll let you decide who got the short straw. Um, but um, oh, the other thing to say is that uh, if I'm going on too long, feel free to tackle me off the stage because um, it's my favourite thing to talk too much. Um, but hopefully some of what I've got to say is um, useful uh, and or interesting to the debate this afternoon. Um, so I should start by saying a little bit about um, the faction. Um, we are a theatre company. We're an ensemble. Um, and we have a core ensemble of actors, as we refer to it, who are our regular collaborators, along with um, regular collaborators um, in an artistic capacity. So music, light, writing, all that sort of thing. Um, and as a group of artists, we take a classic text and we throw it against the wall of our time and we see what bounces back. So we're making the classics for our 21st century audiences. Um, the other sort of bullet point to mention is that we tend to do this without stuff. So we do it, there's a little set and props and stuff as possible. It's about the actors in a space with something to say to an audience. Um, 
Yes, that's sort of it in a nutshell. Um, I've got some brochures with me if anyone's interested that tells you a little bit more about that because, again, I could talk about an hour about the word ensemble itself, but I'll try and stick on brief. Um, so, yeah, let men today are the faction. That is a Julius Caesar quote. That's where we got our name. Um, I figured that the best thing today would be to sort of do a whistle-stop tour of um, what we've done so far and how we've made that work. Um, uh, the learning on the job point is um, about how... Um, as a young person, I didn't really dream about spending Saturday nights wrestling with the Grantian portal on the Arts Council website. Um, but um, And fundraising can be hard, but at the same time, I think that any artist in any discipline giving it a go is a really good idea because it really does make you evaluate the work you're doing and ask the tough questions about what it is you're doing, why you're doing it, and who you're doing it for. It's never a bad thing to sort of have those questions asked, and you'd never be asked enough times. Um, the other thing to say is that... Um, that's quite typical, I think, in the theatre world. Like, I tend to refer to myself as a director and an accidental producer. Um, I sort of want to make plays, so I have to find ways to do that. Um, and the other thing to say is that it's quite personal, therefore, my experience with fundraising, as I have been learning as I've been going along, and um, the faction have actually made uh, 35 projects in eight years, 25 main house shows, which, um, quite frankly, is a stupid amount of work. And quite often we get asked, but how have you done it? And sometimes um, I'm not sure either. Um, but one thing I think that has made it possible is that I've been extremely fortunate in having a really good pay-the-rent job. And that's not to be underestimated because you've got to eat. And even if you are lucky enough to get all of your funding, that might be for a project, but then you've still got the three months in between the projects or X, Y, Z, and you've got rent to pay and all of that stuff. And so that's made a significant amount of difference. And so I think that's actually quite interesting, having picked up on some of the other things that people have been saying about the reality of making work. Um, so, yep, so we'll do a whistle-stop tour from 2008 to present. It's been nine years already. Um, and then I think, hopefully, along the way, I should be able to point out the things that make us a good case study for this conversation, um, and also maybe some things that are unique to our situation, which might highlight some other interesting things, or at least I hope and then sort of where we are at now and where we hope to go in the not too distant future. Um, so yay, the first three years on one slide, I promise it's gonna be quick. Um, the faction started um, really from an inspiration of European theatre, which is quite a zeitgeist thing at the moment. Um, there's a lot of talk about the aesthetic of European theatre, European being quite a broad term, because of course French theatre is different to German theatre, is different to Polish theatre, etc., etc. Um, but Mark Leipacker, my um, co-director, was really inspired um, 15 years ago by work he saw as a young um, man um, by the Schaubühne in Berlin. Um, but not just by the work, but by the way they make work in Germany. It's a huge amount of subsidy in Germany, which has its merits and obviously its challenges in its own right. Um, but the idea of having um, an ensemble that is contracted for a year, um, they work on a repertory where there are new titles, but there are also plays that have been playing for as long as 10 years in any one season. Um, and um, they work with the same artists a lot. Um, so that was one part of the inspiration for the model of the company. And then the other thing is eight years ago, there was really very little classical work happening um, off the big stages. There was certainly very little Shakespeare and even less good Shakespeare. Um, and I wasn't actually there in the very beginning. Mark founded the company and he founded it with a real passion for Shakespeare, and that's become the backbone of our work. So it started um, with a production of Richard III with 27 artists, um, 27 actors, um, for the production at the Broccoli Jack studio, which, if you know the Broccoli Jack, it's probably got a surface area similar to this stage, so 27 actors in that space was quite interesting. Um, and it started um, uh, the company, and... Um, the company started on a model that is very, I think, common when you start a theatre company in that everyone got um, a small fee and then anything that was made off box office revenue it was a profit share, totally equal, um, open book policy. Um, and that's, um, that's how the first project happened. There was a tiny investment from um, a private donor to make sure that we could pay the deposit on the um, theatre hire. Um, and then otherwise, that was a go. Um, but yeah, um, talking about that, is that the first priority in any funding for us is always about paying the artists. Um, it's always about paying everybody equally. There's an, um, and it's um, always about doing whatever we can to make that a number one priority without compromising any of the values of the work, which is sort of the heart of the challenge, I think. Um, so box office revenue was obviously very important from the early days. It's very important for any um, emerging theatre company and also um, 
thing about that being important is that then comes uh, it raises challenges of cash flow because if you're waiting for the payout at the end of the project you've got to think about how you're going to um, make the weekly or monthly payments whatever the agreement is with your artists um, and so you're learning very quickly about how to strategize things as well as thinking I just want to make a play um, um, so yeah so that was the first project um, the second and third and fourth project, um, which was more Shakespeare, it was Macbeth, The Tempest, and um, Twelfth Night, all happened in a very similar way. They happened at the Broccoli Jack and at the Tabard Theatre, which are quite um, quite common sort of early stage um, performance spaces for young theatre companies. Um, and um, uh, they started to go really well. There seemed to be a response. There seemed to be an appetite for the work. Um, and... Um, and so then there was the appetite to make more work. We then did a Schiller play called Intrigue Love, or if you're Michael Grandage, Louise Miller, um, which we did at Southwark Playhouse because they had a last-minute programming slot. It was in the old Southwark Playhouse, if you know it, under London Bridge. And um, David Byrne, who, not the David Byrne, well, the David Byrne to me, but not the mus musician David Byrne, David Byrne, who runs the new Diorama Theatre, which is just off Euston, in, just off Warren Street near Euston, um, had just taken over at that point. And David is an extraordinary individual and their team has, re I can't overestimate the impact that um, his vision for that building has had on our company because his vision is about supporting emerging companies in a way that really no other um, uh, uh, funding body or any other um, venue does. I mean, it really is what they exist to do. Um, he happened to really like Schiller, so he was really pleased to see it happening on the small stage at Southwark. So um, we had a chat with him. And he programmed us to do another Schiller, which was The Robbers. Um, Schiller's not a big um, seller. I mean, since Rob Ike's done at the Almeida and done Mary Stewart, that might help us a little bit. Um, it can be quite a niche, niche um, sort of uh, area of work, but there are definitely some Schiller fans out there. Um, and for that production, we won the Peter Brook Award, which then sort of put us on the map in terms of recognition, which um, we don't make work for the awards or for the reviews, but there is um, an intrinsic link between how they help you get funding and how they help you sell tickets, which means you can pay your artists. So it's all about sort of me navigating my feelings towards those two different things and how they influence each other. Um, so then we did a production of A Midsummer Night's Dream, which was our, also our first national tour. We went up to Buxton, we went to Burnley, we did a lot of work with the youth theatre there, which was great. Um, and um, for the model we were working on at that point, um, the tour managed to fund itself. It was a company of eight actors and two, um, a director and a producer and a stage manager. So it was a relatively small company for us. Um, and um, uh, that was um, when we were still touring across the UK. We also did small projects like Canterbury Tales and not the Oddest, but the Odyssey um, at venues like um, Hampton Court Palace and um, uh, um, the British Museum, which was great because it's about like trying to find new audiences, engaging across a different way. You put those names on fundraising applications, people start to take you seriously. So it was also about finding small opportunities um, to sort of showcase our work. Um, after the success of The Robbers, David said, do you want to be an associate company? We don't quite know what that means yet, but I know I want some associate companies. And we're like, yeah, that sounds good. Um, we also applied for charity status. This is like now 2011. Um, uh, because we felt like that would give us more opportunities for fundraising. Um, and also having a board would mean that we were responsible to some people other than ourselves, which felt like the next grown up thing to do. Maybe we did that a little bit early because actually finding the capacity to manage a board is um, you know, something not to be taken lightly. You have to have the time to make sure you're doing the management accounts, to make sure you're communicating with them, et cetera, et cetera. But at the same time, it gave us an infrastructure to rely on. Um, we were also really fortunate in that in the early days, we had some people come and see our work um, and they really loved it. And um, it happened to be that they were also philanthropists and this was a little bit of luck. Um, and so um, we sought advice and actually um, there's been so many people that have given us advice and um, uh, that also can't really have a monetary value. But I think asking as many people as you can how you're going to do this is a really important part of the process. Um, and one of the people giving his advice happened to be um, one of the um, sort of top guys in uh, individual giving at the National Theatre. So he was really good about teaching us how to ask people for money, which is still something I hate doing, but it's one of those um, necessary evils. And I think moving forward, um, we're going to have to get a lot better at it um, because I think that's the future of 
um, making mo uh, raising money for the company. Um, so we had a little bit of individual giving, we had charity status, we got the Peterbrook Award, and we had David Byrne saying, do you want to have this as a home for a bit? And so 2011, things seemed to be going pretty well. So we're at the new diorama, and David said, what is it you guys really want to do? And we explained about the vision for the company, about the repertory model in Germany, about the ensemble, about um, all of these things. And so we said, what we'd really like is eight weeks of your season, so we can do three plays with the same company of actors, um, all cross-cast through without and perform in rep, not in the sort of UK rep of one week, one week, one week, but in the European rep of alternating nights. And he said, okay then, and let me know what I can do to help. So we're like, okay, now we need to do this. Because at that point, an eight-week commitment felt like quite a big deal. The New Dial Rama's an 80-seat studio theatre, so um, it seemed like a fair size. But at the same time, we were, gonna, um, we were sort of asking the artist to come along on this journey, a little bit of the unknown. And still at the time, we're talking about paying people a small fee. I think for this, to be honest, it was £500 plus profit share. So we had like 15 artists agree to do 14 weeks work on this basis. So there's quite a lot of um, responsibility that comes with that. Um, luckily, we made some really good work, which is um, sometimes luck and sometimes all the other stuff as well. Um, and uh, the rep season went really well. No one else was working in rep, um, certainly off the big stages at that time in the Fringe, Northwest End. Um, the, um, we got our first national reviews, um, which was great because Michael Billington really loved Mary Stewart, which was one of the plays, um, which um, meant that we sold out. We sold out enough to then sell out a th three-week run nine months later at the New Diorama of just that show. Um, and um, people seemed to really respond to this idea, which was the most exciting thing for us, of rep and an ensemble. We had people coming to see all three plays in the season, and it meant that they felt a connection and an ownership to the company. And um, that was great, because it meant that all of those things that we were hoping for were to some extent achieved. Um, we were then lucky enough um, that, <laughs> again, another little bit of luck, um, there was a new cultural center set up in Qatar, in Doha, and um, the chief aide of the programmer happened to catch Mary Stuart matinee and said, I was going to suggest we take um, the young Vic's Hamlet over, but how about um, if you wanted to bring Mary Stuart over instead? We were like, that would be okay. Um, so then we worked out how to do a technical rider for an international tour. And um, by this point, we had um, an a, a accountant on our board. And she also happened to um, be the previous finance director of Complicite. And we said, this is what we're thinking. What do you think? And she said, great, just times it by six. And we were like, great, OK. So um, that gave us money enough to pay people properly for the first time. And that was a real turning point. Because um, we'd always said that once we were in a position to pay people an adequate weekly wage, adequate, in inverted commas, um, adequate weekly wage, there was never going to be going back from that. There was never going to, it was never going to be about profit share again. It was never going to be about um, not um, offering people at least London living wage for their work. So um, that was quite a big deal. So all this happened around this one project. Um, we sort of made the, the, the initial funding for rep season, I should talk about that a little bit, shouldn't I, um, from um, doing some events. We held a birthday party, and we like um, absolutely rinse our connections. I don't know how many times my friends have been sent emails asking them for stuff to auction or to, um, you know, or to come and support or to come to an event so they can buy a beer and da-da-da-da-da. So that we do quite a lot of events. That, that brings in a small amount of money. Um, we started to build our individual giving um, again, based on the connections we'd made um, previously. Um, and um, the box office revenue um, was better than we'd anticipated because the season was a success and we sold out, which meant there was more money to share across the board. Um, the, the next thing we did um, was uh, we took, um, we, took um, we went back to a Midsummer Night's Dream and we performed it in Brockwell Park, where we pre previously performed our Shakespeare. And the great thing about um, Brockwell Park was that it was a real community of opportunity to connect with um, people um, in the Brixton area um, who wouldn't necessarily normally be our, um, our uh, audience at the New Diorama. Um, and the other great thing about performing in a park is that there's no venue hire and we were supported by um, the arts team that are part of the parks committee. Um, however, the challenge with that is that, of course, you rely on the weather. And previously, <laughs> where we'd done very well in, in Brockwell Park, um, that summer season was the um, only project, I think, in our history where we lost money. So, you know, swings and roundabouts, but it's all about sort of um, risk and, risk and um, seeing what happens a little bit. 
So end of rep season 2012, things going quite well. The project had gone better than we expected. Um, we were going to Doha to take a play about religious fundamentalism to the Middle East. Um, we, were, um, we, we had some reviews. Um, we were a charity. Yay, let's do it again. Let's do another rep season. So that's what we did. Um, we started to try and think about our programming and how that might help in terms of um, audience figures. Um, so we asked Ranjit Bolt, who is an RSC um, uh, alumni, um, to write our Three Sisters adaptation. Um, we looked at our titles. We thought Chekhov would be good. We did Blood Wedding. There's a lot of school groups that still study Blood Wedding. Um, and um, we did um, what else? Three Sisters. Oh, and Fiesco, which was another Schiller. Um, we also then started to really evaluate how we can use partnerships and partnerships have been really fundamental to us because it's not necessarily about the physical mon monetary value you can have in exchange with a partner but also what they can offer you um, and um, uh, so whether it be working in partnership with someone for free rehearsal space or um, working in partnership with someone because they're going to bring an audience to Q&A or whatever but really starting to think laterally about how we can um, how we can also um, raise our, uh, our audience development and our fun. Okay, great. Um, so, um, and that was the first time we also received ACE funding. It was one application straight in the bag and um, there, uh, and um, we got that. So yay, thank you Arts Council. Um, then um, Rep Season 24, it was a very similar thing. Um, we um, also got um, Arts Council funding for that. We got our first um, Trust and Foundation money from the Golson Corp Foundation. Um, so that's probably um, funding about um, uh, uh, 30% of the um, of the overall budget between the two of those, and then we did a project that was um, about smaller smaller work that we might be able to tour. So, uh, we did a series of solo shows called Reptember. Um, we did our first crowdfunding campaign for that um, because it felt like the natural fit. But um, crowdfunding isn't something we tend to rely on because we feel like we're it's quite peer led and we're already asking them to buy a ticket, so we don't want to ask them for their money twice. We did another rep season, which um, we weren't successful in securing ACE um, funding for, unfortunately. Um, so that started to give us um, a new pressure um, and rely more on our individual giving, um, which um, has, has um, proven successful. But at the same time, the key for us now um, moving to the future is how we survive without relying on a big, big um, input from Arts Council or from other subsidy. Um, and then um, we've been at the New Dharma for five years last year. Um, so we knew that it was time to move on to a bigger venue. And I'm trying to go through this quickly so I can wrap up. Um, and um, last year was a huge year. So we did um, a new production of Richard III at um, the um, New Dharma. And we brought back the um, solo shows. And we ran them in rep. So it was a slightly different model of offering our audience something slightly different. We applied to the Arts Council four times for that project and we didn't get the money. Um, so then that put an extraordinary pressure on us and all of a sudden I was like I now have 20 people that I need to pay so that they can eat and yeah I just wanted to make a play but it's going to be all right um again thanks to New Diorama um allowing us um a bit of leniency in um when we paid our rent and also um uh we had an, a new supporter come on board we managed to make ends meet with that and we still sold enough tickets to make sure that we covered our costs um we also went to Wilton's last year. We did a show at Southwark Playhouse last year. And then Selfridges commissioned us to do a production of Much To Do About Nothing. And Selfridges paid for everything, which was delightful. It was, we got to do a Shakespeare without having to pay for it. And we even got a fee for it, which was great. And so leveraging on those corporate relationships, um, although some people find that uncomfortable, is the reality of the future. It then also meant that Mark and I could afford to go to Lebanon for six weeks to do um, King Lear in Arabic, which neither of us speak, um, with a group of Arabic <laughs> artists, um, which was supported by the British Council. Thank you very much. Um, and we also received small grants from the Boris Karloff Foundation, the Thistle Trust, and the Royal Victoria Hall Foundation. And just to mention that, because I think it took us about three years to really nail how you apply to trusts and foundations and ask them for money. And I feel like we've got a lot better at that, um, which is great and we're very grateful. And um, we had conversations with Arts Council about why we didn't get the money, and they said we just chose something else on the day, um, which sort of makes you go, oh God, what I'm doing isn't interesting enough. I don't know how to fix that, um, but I'm sure there's hope for the future. Um, also being a registered charity meant that we could apply for our gift aid um, reimbursement, which is what has funded us this year to do organizational development. So we're looking at the future, and part of the future for us is about developing a relationship like we've had at the New Diorama, hopefully with regional venues, so that we can start to have a conversation outside of London again, um, and also about um, 
uh, how we can build a model that doesn't rely on this subsidy. So a bigger part of the pie is either individual giving and how we can work with our supporters um, to offer them real opportunity uh, or how we can increase our earned income. So what else can we do other than shows to bring in revenue? And I'll stop talking now, I think. Sorry. I hope that was useful. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, Rachel. Imitating the Dog formed in uh, 1998, nearly 20 years ago, as a group of students coming out of the final year of uh, a course at Lancaster, and I was a young lecturer at the time, and I'd been their supervisor in that production. I suppose what happened over the next now would be 20 years next, next year would be a, a, a quite a slow evolution of the company from that small core of, of very enthusiastic young people to uh, a, a process really of professionalization. Uh, the company was very lucky in one respect that it got um, national lottery funding in its second project. 5,000 uh, pounds was quite a small amount of money, but at the time felt quite like quite large sum to play around with. And then within a year, it managed to get uh, a small uh, Arts Council grant. So uh, very early on, it, it got basically project funding. And the company um, worked its way through over those years, basically by making a show every two years. And one of the things that's come out of the, the day so far, just hearing the previous presentation, is this, this idea of the day job, this other job that you have that gives you money that allows you then to uh, somehow sculpt out some time that you can create this artistic practice. Now, obviously, working in the university, uh, you get two things. You obviously get paid, and it's not bad. And you also get time, although that's been squeezed uh, within the university sector. But uh, Imitating a Dog uh, is a company that's, if, if one could call it a success, has been based on the fact that it's had an enormous amount of support from the university sector, both in terms of equipment and in terms of space, time, and other types of resources like uh, rehearsal spaces. A bit like the previous speaker, Rachel, talking about that support from a theater, the support that we had from the two institutions that have helped us, which is Central St. Martins here in London and Lancaster in the north, has been crucial to the survival of the company. Well, we're in a very, very interesting uh, juncture at the moment because uh, a few weeks ago we got national portfolio organization funding. And I just wanted to present a little conundrum to you uh, about this funding as, as a possible thing that might be raised in terms of questioning later. Um, what we did as a company was we were doing these small but quite interesting and we were very, you know, for us very intense projects, very much around the notion of theatre, uh, fiction, illusion, and film. Film, would be, we were very interested very early on, uh, perhaps trying to carve a niche for ourselves in what was seems quite an intense market. There was a sort of live art scene, there was the writer's scene. We were very interested in, in the idea of fictions and creating these very close fictional worlds. And of course, the, the, the genre that most created that to the greatest intensity was cinema. It seemed to be the primary storytelling medium of the 20th century into the 21st century. So we started to play around with the idea, how much could theatre start to question cinema or cinematic notions of constructions of realities or fictions or worlds? And how much could cinema, by, by sort of embracing that form, and perhaps some of the making processes as well, question and put into question notions of theatricality. Whilst we were doing these projects and we started to expand as a company, um, we, we met this producer who was working uh, at West Yorkshire Playhouse. In fact, uh, she got fired. And we asked her to work with us for a short while. And she made this proposal, which was to actually do a middle-scale project. And we came up with... Um, Hemingway's A Farewell to Arms, which is a text that we would always been quite interested in, partly because it was, again, very cinematic. It had been made into two films. And yet, at the same time, when you read the novel, felt very literary, and as a piece of sort of modernist literature, still felt very experimental. So we decided that we'd have a go at doing this text. And uh, our producer started to then introduce us to the world of middle-scale touring. 
And the interesting thing about middle scale touring for us as a company was it came with a huge amount of risk. By that I mean we could get a certain amount of Arts, Arts Council funding, in which we did, but that was a third of the total cost of the actual production. So we had to find two thirds of the funding, which I'll tell you was uh, 200,000 pounds through audiences. Now we were getting box office splits, something we had never done before in our touring in Birmingham Rep and other repertory theatres, four or 500 seat, seat theatres, but not knowing whether we could sell the show. What would happen if we didn't sell the show? Well, we'd go bankrupt. But this is the only model that we had and that's, we pursued this. Actually, weirdly, we made a profit on the production. When we went to the Arts Council to do the NPO, one of the things, and this hasn't really been discussed today, and this comes, this is true for grants of the arts, is you generally have to find a third of your funding, at least, that's not Arts Council. So you have to find this other income strand which will support the Arts Council money that they're prepared to put in. And it's even more so in the NPO. So our model for the NPO is to continue this process of create, I wouldn't call it a classic necessarily, but it's a text or a film or an artifact that's generally going to be popular, people are going to be interested in, and we're going to adapt that, and we'll take that to the middle scale, hopefully to draw in enough income to pay for our other work, which is smaller scale, perhaps more experimental, and the formal developmental creative experiments that we pursue in those smaller scale works will then feed into the larger scale works that we create on these middle scale stages. Now, when we did the NPO, that was our strategy. And I've got to be honest with you, I never thought we would be successful. We're told that it would be a very, very small chance that we get the money. And we have got the money. So now we have to do it. And that is a completely different other story. It raises a number of questions. One, is it possible to do it? And can you sustain it over a four year period? But the other bigger question that we are having to wrestle with, or of course, in one sense, we've already committed to it, is do we want to do it? Because it presents all sorts of challenges, if you like, to the integrity of the work. And um, I'll just give you one, one of the things that came up this morning, which I, we, we, this morning, this afternoon, the earlier uh, talks, was this notion that uh, the digital or, or playing with these new technologies, which we certainly do to a great deal, um, uh, is somehow uh, uh, pursued across all these different art forms. They are, but they all do it very, very differently in very different economic uh, situations, but perhaps more importantly, through very, very different processes, and they're not compatible. We've worked two or three times with repertory companies creating digital, if you like, cinematic projection works in a way that they find almost completely unworkable. For us, the digital, if you like, the projection work is like another actor. There's no separation for us between the technicians and the directors. They're part of the creative team. If you go into repertory theater, which has got a two-day technical run before the show's put on, it's an anathema to work in that way. Actors don't like it. Directors don't like it. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So actually to work in these other establishments with different sets of working practices, you have to change the working practices quite fundamentally to allow a proper sort of creative exchange to take place. We did a, a, a piece called um, The Passion, which was um, working with homeless people uh, in Manchester, which was broadcast, I think, by Channel 4. And we, we basically did the, the projection work and the camera work in creating a kind of live filming of this, of this piece. And what was extraordinary for us as sort of amateur filmmakers and theater practitioners was when Channel 4 came in with a two-day setup to then shoot it live, I think it was either Channel 4 or BBC Two, um, it completely changed the game. We were just pushed aside by the professionalization that these cameras had to work like this, this is how it operates. This is where you have to be. It was very made very clear to us that we were no longer needed in that very high tense production uh, dynamic process that they were going through. So it's all very well for the Arts Council to say that they're going to have this sort of across the piece digitalization uh, in the arts. 
it's sort of meaningless at the base where you create the practice through process and interaction with the types of uh, material that you're dealing with. Because unless the actual institutions allow time to play, to experiment with performers that are prepared to do that, then actually nothing will ever change. And that's a dilemma I think we'll be facing in the next four years. Of course, I'm very, very happy to have the funding, but I'm also quite scared about it as well. That's an end, by the way. Thanks, Andrew.